present-day Vancouver, one could argue, is still a small city aspiring to be world-class. Hip and trendy describes its mostly sanitized present. It's hard to imagine today a Vancouver that had a much brighter past. Yes, it was the capital of neon before Las Vegas, up until the mid-50s. Rob Gillette is the rarest of craftsmen. He makes mercury, argon gas, and electrons dance. Like you can actually see the mercury traveling through the tube. And as it travels, you can also notice how it gets bright. Once I started actually hands-on and started doing it and realizing how intricate and a bit difficult it is, it was fun because it was almost like five years before I really started to feel comfortable doing it where I could get a job and not, not worry about stress, like, well, how am I gonna make it, and how am I gonna do this and this and this? So it, it, it makes you feel good that you're actually learning something that's pretty difficult. Today, Rob is one of the last light benders left in Vancouver. The work requires incredible focus. When designing a piece, Gillette plays electrician. The evil mercury, that is one of the evilnesses of this trade. Chemist, glass blower, and artist all at once. See now it's moving. As soon as it starts to move, nah, you gotta you gotta watch what you're doing. Most of the guys that I know are, are now out of the industry. They're uh, working as electricians. Some other guys just went into other things and just walked away from it. That's a lot of talent going away. That's a lot of talent. And uh, personally, I know like three or four guys that phenomenal, talented two benders, neon two benders, that are gone. To truly understand what dimmed the prospects of neon in Vancouver, you have to go back to the 1950s. A group calling itself the Community Arts Council started an anti-neon movement, complaining it was visual pollution overtaking the city. There was a desire to make Vancouver look modern and show off its natural setting. Neon had to go. They put out little cards you could send the mayor telling him why you didn't want neon. People felt that it was um, a, I think tawdry and I think they associated it with an, an earlier Vancouver which they saw as kind of more workaday and commercial and they were perhaps enchanted with a new vision of Vancouver which was Vancouver the beautiful, almost the supernatural. <laughs> We're kind of suffering from that still to this day, aren't we? Well, we are, I think we're living out the, we're living we're living out that um, that concept of this as an urban place. Yes. The anti-neon movement eventually won out. In 1974, Vancouver implemented a comprehensive sign control bylaw that greatly restricted new neon signs, and so began the slow death of the color tubes. Vancouver Museum currently has an exhibit called Neon Vancouver, Ugly Vancouver, running till August. I think that um, thinking about this as at its uses in public art, I think it could come back, and I actually think there's quite an openness at City Hall. I think the biggest problems now are economic and they're sort of practical. Um, this is much more expensive than um, an LED sign. The city has relaxed bylaws surrounding neon, and it's also encouraged public art using modern LED lights. They're cheaper to run and last much longer, and that may be the final blow to neon craftsmen like Gillette. Gillette has a lot more time on his hands. Ever since 2005, when LED hit the market, work has dramatically dropped. In the old days, Gillette spent just 20% of his time maintaining old signs. Today, it's the bulk of his work. Like in 10 years, there's no students, there's no apprentices, nobody's learning this. So in 10 or 15 years, you know, what are you gonna have? You might have some hack who doesn't know what he's doing, but he can get the job kinda done. But where's those guys that were really doing the quality stuff, you know, and the good work and the stuff that would last for 50, 60 years, right?